Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, the Harlem Shake, a dance that's gone viral and led to thousands of copycats, getting us wondering why certain stories get shared, emails get forwarded, or videos go viral. Our digital producer Malika Blal is here looking out for your live feedback. Malika, a lot of people are saying they're not really so concerned about what's going viral. It's the fact that when it does, it really connects people. Exactly. And it's that connection that they're talking about, especially breaking cultural barriers yeah. like uh, race. And in this case, language. Laffy on Twitter says, these videos, Gangnam Style, Harlem Shake, become a kind of common language we speak globally, but with different accents. Now, for those of you at home, we want to know what you think on this topic. So join the conversation by using the hashtag AJStream. All right, and joining us on the set is Alexander Howard. He is the Washington correspondent for O'Reilly Media. He's an authority on the use of collaborative technology in enterprises, social media, and digital journalism. Alex, welcome back to the stream. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you. I'd also like to welcome our Google Plus Hangout panel, who's going to join us throughout the discussion. And of course, you can join the stream via Google Plus as well. All you have to do is go to the link below. There it is. Oh, there's Lil Bub. You're going to meet her and add us to your circles. Hi, my name is David Drake. I'm a staff writer at Complex Magazine, and I'm in the stream. So the Harlem Shake has much of the world flailing their bodies as thousands of copycat videos continue to inundate YouTube. And although not in the exact style that it is now, this is the video that started it all. They do the Harlem Shake. And now it's morphed into a global craze that has athletes, celebrities, and even cartoon characters shaking erratically for 30 seconds. Take a look. Con los terroristas. They do the Harlem shit. So in a world where two days of video are uploaded every minute, what makes viral videos stand out? And how is this rapid fire information overload impacting our societies and us? To help us answer that is Jonah Berger, professor of marketing at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the author of the book Contagious, Why Things Catch On. So if you ever have wondered why those stories get shared, emails get forwarded, or certain videos just go viral, this book explains why. And that shows how to leverage these concepts to craft contagious content. Jonah, welcome to the stream. Thanks so much for having me. So if there was a formula to making a video go viral, Jonah, I guess everyone would be using it. But your research is probably the closest thing to figuring out what makes stuff catch on. What are some of the factors that you think cause a video to go viral? You know, I think people look at these one-off videos or these particular pieces of content and they think it's luck that it's random, that it's somehow chance that one thing gets shared or something else gets shared. Um, but what our work shows is that it's not random and it's not luck. There's actually a science to it. Uh, there's a psychology behind social transmission, why people talk about and share some things rather than others. And as we talk about in the book, there's six key principles that, that drive people to talk and share. Um, everything from social currency, which is uh, people talking about things that make them look good. Uh, being one of the first people, for example, among your circle of friends to share the Harlem Shake shows that you're in the know and ahead of the time. Um, but also things like emotion. Uh, emotion plays a big role in, in what people share as well. And high arousal emotions, just like what you might feel from watching the Harlem Shake for the first time, uh, encourages people to pass and share things on because it activates them. So uh, we found that six key things, or six key psychological principles that, that repeatedly drive people to talk and share across a wide variety of content, both online as, as well as offline. Okay, we'll hold those six key principles up during the show and see if they are in sync with some of these videos. Millions of hits. Some of the best known viral videos have included cats, rainbows, music, marriage proposals, cute kids. It is a huge variety. Take a look. Open Gangnam Style. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. Okay, now. Okay, now I. Thank you. 
Chocolate ring Oh, has to be falling yesterday Chocolate ring Double rainbow all the way across the sky. <laughs> oh my god. Ain't nobody got time for that. They do the Harlem I don't think we've laughed this much on the show in a long time. So, so Alex, is there some kind of common thread, common denominator that we can see throughout all these videos that go viral? Well, I think there's something about them being universally accessible. Um, video itself as a medium is much more easy to look at right away and immediately see for anyone, regardless of language, regardless of literacy. You, yeah. you can see it. And if it means something to you personally, um, then you're much more likely to share it. And of course, that's what makes something go viral, especially in the age of social media. I, I think that uh, certain elements rise up. Um, music is something that unites us. Food is something that unites us. Uh, I think clearly animals are something that are very popular. <laughs> Obviously, cats come up here. Um, and uh, I think there, there's also something uh, in the kind of more greater human expression, right? And it can be negative, right? Yeah. Extreme moments of anger. Um, it can be extreme moments of sorrow. Or it can be extreme moments of joy, right? That wonderful viral video about, of a marriage there, you know? I, I think those speak to um, what it is to be human. It, and it gets, I think, uh, away from the technology and ships it down to what are the things that are inspire us, um, what are the things that um, make us, I think, um, more connected to each other or to what someone else is experiencing somewhere else. Um, and I mean, I think uh, profoundly. They make us laugh, right? Yeah. I mean, laughter is so unifying. They're authentic too, in many cases. I mean, but not can, everyone you know. is convinced, unfortunately. Uh -huh. And not on Twitter Please. says we've gained much, but we've also lost direct connection to people and things. And yes, creativity and attention has suffered. Mm. Adam Mordecai, I want to pose that one to you. You are a viral curator at Upworthy, and I have mm. uh, Upworthy pulled up on my screen here. But you don't just share things that make us smile. You also share things that make us think, like this video, which went viral, saw it all over my feeds this weekend about poverty mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. First of all, what is a viral curator and what are the type of things uh, that you curate? Uh, a viral curator is basically somebody who finds things on the Internet and helps frame them in a way that makes them more shareable for the general public. So I find things, give them a better headline, and then see how many people I can get to share them using a better share image and a better description. Um, and so, you know, we try to find things with more substance and more meaning and try to make it entertaining enough that people feel um, really excited about sharing it all over the Internet. Because ordinarily a video about poverty may not go viral, but it's because of your headline uh, that made it do so? Yeah, exactly. Like, it, usually what will happen is, is someone will name it generically what it's supposed to be really about. Like a New York Times headline would be Obama uh, reverses position on gay marriage. Since you already know what that's about, you have no reason to click on it on Facebook. So our version would be, this is why I voted for Barack Obama. And you're, you know, a little more compelled and curious to find out what that's all about. So by using a more interesting headline, we can draw people to the content and get them to see things that they wouldn't normally look at. So, Jonah, what is it about the serious videos, though, like Coney 2012, that would make that go viral versus something like the Harlem Shake, which, I mean, it's obvious that it's so entertaining. I think uh, all the examples that you've shown and many of uh, what the other commenters have been talking about is pure emotion, um, whether we're talking about anger or inspiration, anger like the Coney 2012 video, uh, inspiration like Susan Boyle or like the Double Rainbow, or even other emotions like humor, for example. All those are, are not just emotions, they have something in common. They're high arousal emotions. Uh, and what our research shows, we, we looked at over six months of New York Times articles, over 7,000 articles, everything written by the Times to see what made the most emailed list. And what we found is that high arousal emotion is a big driver of sharing. So it's not random that anger things or uh, awe-inspiring things are shared. Even though those seem like very different emotions, one is a negative one, one is a positive one, they're both activating emotions. They fire us up and they drive us to action, which encourages us to share. And, and Corey here echoes something that you said earlier, Alex. He says, we see ourselves in memes. If there's a cultural resonance and aha, I could do that moment, mm. we appreciate them more, so, and share. Um, but I want to go to Slade in our hangout now. Slade Somer, uh, the Coney 2012 video was just mentioned and earlier you gave our producers kind of an interesting insight into Coney because you said 
it wasn't necessarily uh, about the meaning behind it. You know, it, it caused people to share it, but what was the what was the message behind what they were sharing, and did they really know anything about it? Yeah, I mean, I think right now, I don't know how many months ago Coney 2012 is, but right now, if you asked everyone who clicked share or like about Coney 2012, they could not tell you what country Coney 2012 was in. They could tell you maybe the continent was Africa, where he is now, what he did. We live in a good culture that lets people have activism at their fingertips, and it's never been easier to be an activist. But at the same time, I'm not so sure that that was a high arousal emotion thing as your, as your guest was discussing. I think a lot of that was, I'm going to click a button because I saw a lot of people fired up about this. Whether or not those people were actually fired up is a different story. It, there is a lemmings component to viral videos and not to play the Debbie Downer, that's just uh, you know a part of the culture we live in. Alex, do you think that these videos have the ability to break down barriers like race and gender or cultural barriers? Uh, I think that's possible for them to do that. Um, to, to the uh, last speaker's point, um, I think that one of the key aspects of Coney is that there was actually an infrastructure laid in by that organization, Invisible Children, um, and then uh, several very influential uh, celebrities who then shared the video. I'm thinking of Oprah and Justin Bieber, mm -hmm. uh, who drove a lot of attention to it. And um, that's uh, actually the role of thinking about Upworthy, too, to find things that are interesting and then drive attention to them. There's a, gr kind of the, there's a great um, attention economy people talk about that a lot of social news sites really traffic in now and are elevating what's most interesting in the web at a given time. It doesn't always mean it's the most um, relevant, doesn't always mean it's the most important or even culturally significant, uh, but sometimes it can be. Um, and uh, there are pieces of um, video uh, that we can describe as Samizdat that are coming out of uh, the Middle East, something actually that uh, this station has been very well known for curating. Um, and certainly a piece of video like Adnita from Iran in 2009, which you could fairly describe as a viral video, mm -hmm. uh, obviously drew attention to what was happening there in a way that maybe few other things could. Um, I think uh, in an age where many people are experiencing some form of disaster fatigue, mm -hmm. sometimes it takes something like that to break down people's callous and to see that someone somewhere else in the world is experiencing some th moment of great joy or great pain and to think about whether um, they want to be involved in changing that or not. Um, it could perhaps think of, uh, you think of uh, cheapening the experience, this idea of clicktivism or slacktivism right. gets cited. Um, but if it's an entree into a much more serious engagement where you get moved up the ladder, right, to actually writing, to, sh to showing up to meetings, to becoming um, you know, much more invested, uh, having stronger ties with it, um, then you can make a case that um, these kinds of media um, may pull people in that might not be otherwise. You know, breaking down cultural barriers is exactly what one American traveler did. His name is Matt Harding, and he went around the world dancing. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this. So, Jonah, what is it about a video like that that earned it 10 million views? You know, I, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record here, but I, I think it, it was very similar to what we've talked about already, that, that sense of possibility, that amazement that someone could do something like this, that they literally danced around the world. It's, it's pure remarkability. Um, it's not only surprising, it's really interesting and really amazing. Uh, and it inspires us to think about how to change our own lives and encourage us to share it with others to help them change theirs as well. Does there have to be more to this? Can this just be fun and entertaining in a way for people now, you know, globally to connect? I, I think it's more than that. I mean, I, I agree that one of the reasons we share things is to connect with others, but there's also a number of other motivations. One reason we share things is to self-present, to, to shape how other people see us. That's one reason why we share things that make us look good rather than make us look bad. We, we talk about the promotion we got, but we don't talk as much about you know, bad things that happen to us or cases where we get swindled or tricked by somebody. We talk about things that make us look good rather than bad. Um, we also share things that are useful to others, uh, information that doesn't evoke emotion but that has that practical 
incredible value to help someone else's life. So it's not just connecting. That is definitely one motivation, but there's other motivations behind sharing as well. Right, we're back to the motivation of connecting. Ryan Thomas on Facebook says, I support anything that unites us as a people of Earth, even if it's silly. In fact, sometimes it's the silliest things that unite us the best. And I want to go to Howard Davies' I know who Davies you're going car. to next. Yes, <laughs> Howard Davies' car first. Uh, and not that this was silly, but this was a video that went viral uh, because one brother bit his brother's mm. finger. Charlie bit my finger. The, the father of Charlie and Harry uh, is in our hangout. Tell us the motivation behind you posting that on YouTube. The whole motivation about posting it was to share it with the boy's godfather who lives in America. So I wanted to share it with friends and family uh, and make sure they just saw a very funny moment that happened at home. And Charlie and Harry, you guys are so big now. There you are in the video. Wow. So did, did the two of you, uh, what did you guys think? We were too young to know then. But what do you think now that millions of people around the world uh, watch Charlie bite your finger, Harry? I'm not really sure. Do you feel famous? Yes. I bet you do. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. This is quite a surprise. We didn't know we would see all three of you today. Thank you. <laughs> no, Mike in our hangout, Mike Bradavsky, uh, you are the, uh, um, y you have a pet named Lil Bub, and your, your pet is another thing that makes us feel good, that's mm. shared around, your cat. Um, tell us about that and, and what makes it that it connects with so many people. Yeah, you know, it was, a, it was a big surprise to me when it happened, but um, I discovered I was getting all these crazy messages from people and I posted a few photos of her online, uh, really like heartwarming messages about how <clears throat> Bub gets them through the day. And some messages are, are really, really pretty intense, you know. Um, kids with chronically ill, chronically ill children were sending me messages saying how Bub makes them feel better every day. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was really heartwarming to find that out. So, Alex, you know, in terms of, I mean, this is all fun and it's great, mm -hmm. but there's another component to all of this, and it's, we have this expectation now as a society that if something happens halfway around the globe, we know about it in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and everything is neatly packaged into, you know, 10 second sound bites and 30 second videos, and we want everything fast, fast, fast. Is this detro destroying our attention spans, and is it really reducing our tolerance for things that that are more in-depth, more meaningful? Uh, well, this is, I think, a constant thread we've heard concerns about now for the last decade. Uh, and certainly people are concerned that the Internet is making us um, um, unable to focus. And um, I, I, I'm a little torn about it. I think the, you know, the modern media environment is messy. It's inherently messy. Uh, people consume immense amounts of short uh, pieces of information. Obviously, I spend time on Twitter, and I share information there because that's a, a modern way to get through. Um, I, I do think that um, there's also uh, still quite, quite clear interest in long-form journalism, though, too. All you have to go is to the long read or long-form tags on Twitter to see that, or to see that some of the most popular articles on the New York Times site are still long-form. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bit of both. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, that um, the, uh, the age of bite-sized content isn't going anywhere, right? Um, that um, lots of these little 30-second videos are very popular because they're so easy to quickly view and share on. And that's one of the reasons the Harlem Shake, I think, has kind of broke is because it's short and it's easy to reproduce and take that form and put it elsewhere. Well, Chris Priller, in, in our hangout, there's questions about the negativity of this and whether or not it could be a bad thing. Jazar on Twitter says, it often results in important points being lost in cyberspace and at times ignored. Close becomes far, far gets close. There's also a video comment. Have a listen and let me know what you think after. Proofs are creative and ingenious, but doesn't it kill one's originality in a weird yet twisted way? It's actually quite strange. People choose to remix an existing video instead of creating complete something completely original that could potentially go viral. So Chris, you're the founder of Locker Gnome. Does this kill originality? No, in fact, I think it enhances it. And to uh, come back to the idea of negativity, I've long said that Twitter is a great place to tell the world what you're thinking before you've had a chance to think about it. <laughs> is and that a good thing? <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing, uh, but the immediacy of being able to share your thoughts uh, sometimes trips us up because we may not always have the emotional maturity we believe we always have. Mm. And, you know, because it's so simple to share your thoughts from point A to point B, anybody can do it, anybody is doing it. Uh, and it's long been said, too, in terms of Internet communities that you have 
most of the participants acting as lurkers. They're still a part of that community, but they're never really going to step forward or say anything. You may have more people watching the stream than actually participating directly that you can you can recognize. Definitely. Uh, but it's still, they're still as much a part of it. It's it's, and I think that's part of remix culture. It's easier to take something that someone else has done and regurgitate or or to share it. Yeah. So. Alex, you say that in general, these things are not going to go away, but we've got to ask the question, although things like the Harlem Shake are still popular, when are they all going to stop being fun like the Shake did for, for these folks? Con los terroristas. <laughs> viral videos they have their day in the sun and then they're gone or does the whole craze at some point die out well, I, I think that the individual craze like this will eventually die out uh, it, it it's also pretty clear unfortunately that um, there are negative consequences for some people uh, if they participate in the meme in the wrong place uh, I believe there's some lifeguards in California um, who uh, lost employment uh, after doing Gangnam style parody mm -hmm. um, we just heard about some miners in South America uh, who lost their jobs after doing their own version of the Harlem Shake recently um, there are contexts where participating in, in um, something like this may be viewed as either unsafe or, or not correct for the etiquette. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in general, something like this will die off over time, but something else will come along to replace it. And I, I think that's uh, what free expression is all about. Right? And I'm not sure we should be necessarily completely knocking it. Uh, if, if humans want to be humans online and uh, it brings delight to others, I think it's going to continue. All right, on that note, we are going to hit the pause button, say a big thanks to all of our guests for joining us. They're not going anywhere. They're going to stick around so we can continue this conversation in our online post show. So if you're not already there, go to stream.aljazeera.com. But first, Malika's got a couple other stories we're following. Our first lead's from South Africa, where the father of Olympic runner Oscar Pistorius, who's accused of murdering his girlfriend, has come under public scrutiny. Speaking to The Telegraph about South Africa's violent crime rates, Henke Pistorius placed blame on the ruling party, the ANC. When asked about his family's extensive gun collection, he pointed to crime against white South Africans, saying, It speaks to the ANC government. Look at white crime levels, why protection is so poor in this country. It's an aspect of our society. Those comments led netizens to start the hashtag, I blame the ANC. The responses range from, I'm having a bad hair day, I blame the ANC, to unicorns aren't real, I blame the ANC. While other members of the Pistorius family distanced themselves from the comments, the ANC itself responded saying, not only is this statement devoid of truth, it's also racist. It's sad that he has chosen to politicize a tragic incident. Our next lead happened here in Washington, where a member of one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the US has been accused of shortchanging a local waitress. With thousands in town to attend the annual conference for APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, one restaurant worker decided to get political. Nuria Khalifa Jackson wore a t-shirt that read, Occupation isn't pretty. In response, her customer left a note in the back of her receipt saying, Displaying your political beliefs on your shirt costs you a percentage of your tip. Her employer chimed in on Facebook. Today, a member of APAC didn't tip his server. We agree that the occupation isn't pretty and are proud to have her work for us. There's more on both of those stories on our website, so head over to stream.aljazeera.com. Lisa? All right, stay with us. The Post Show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. Now, on tomorrow's program, maybe one person can't change the world, but they can change a country. Some of the most powerful women on the planet aren't famous, you don't know their names, but they're changing minds and laws and empowering people, especially other women, to take a chance, follow their passion, and do something good for the world. You're going to meet them and no doubt be inspired on the next AJ Stream. Until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back to the Streams Online Post Show. I'm Lisa Fletcher. We're still discussing why certain videos like the Harlem Shake and Gangnam Style went viral. Is there a formula to it? And how is the immediacy of the internet impacting our society? Still with us are Alexandra Howard, Jonah Berger, and everyone in our Google Hangout, which is where I want to go back to. Adam Mordecai, viral curator for Upworthy.com. Can viral videos, videos that go viral, have a good effect on society? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the more people, you, more eyes you can get on something that has a good message behind it, the more it'll start to change people's minds. So, by all means, you know, you should you should be sharing things that are important on the internet. Any examples in in recent days or weeks that that uh, remind you of this? Yeah, actually, we had an amazingly big hit uh, from a uh, spoken word poet, believe it or not, which we I didn't think would ever go viral, um, <laughs> but he. Uh, made this amazing animated video about bullying and pretty much the entire world has been experienced bullying at some point or another um, and he you know someone tweeted it to me I uploaded it that night and the next morning we got over a million views and by the end of the week there was over three million and then he got invited to go speak at TED wow. so you know it videos can really be huge if, if they're but they have to be really good they can't just be you know not anything can go viral and I can't make it you know even if it is really good sometimes I can't make it go viral I've only had like we've only had 10 things break a million so it's you know it's luck of the draw a lot of the time but there's a lot of strategies you can use to make make things get a lot more eyes increase on increase your chances um, yeah. well the cool thing about the show today in particular is that it's sparking conversations among people I thought online. it was that we had a little bub on <laughs> well that too of course uh, but it's sparking conversations the speaking pen um, is responding to the video comment that we had about killing originality the speaking pen says we're a culture of copycats because there's nothing new under the sun remixing encourages creativity and limits originality but then he got a response from Reich who says well originals are many a times a bit of intellectual, intelligent copycatism, mm. isn't it? <laughs> so while we all ponder that, I want to go back to our hangout um, and speak to Slade. Slade has a follow-up to something that Chris said earlier. Go ahead, Slade. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. On that subject, you know, there is no formula like we talked about. Jonah says there's six things that can make a video viral, but at the same time, you can do all of those six things according to a checklist. You could have a baby. You could have a cat. You could have a motion. Rainbows. You could have all that. And you're exactly, uh, hippies, you know, and, and your video still might not go viral. So remixing at this point is almost a guarantee. After Sweet Brown did the Ain't Nobody Got Time For That, anyone who remixed a video of that got tens of thousands of views, if not millions. Uh, right now we're seeing uh, the, the meme du jour is Taylor Swift being remixed with goats and paper towel dispensers. Which I've actually just pulled up here on my screen because mm. it's on your site, Hyper Vocal. Taylor That's Swift right. knew you were That's a goat right. when you walked in. Mm. And uh, it's great, and it, uh, but you know, between personal curators and the YouTube algorithm where things are going to show up on the side, you know, we're now living in an age where it almost makes more sense to go out of your way to not be original and to do remixes because that is where the, the views and now because of the views, the money is. Jonah, jump in. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, respectfully, I, I disagree there. So I, I agree that uh, doing remixes is a great way to get some attention. Obviously, people are looking for something that's hot in the moment. Uh, just like Oreos did a nice piggyback in the Super Bowl with following the blackout with a nice timely comment. Uh, if the Harlem Shake is popular now, doing a Harlem Shake video will get you more attention now. Um, but it's not about cats, it's not about babies, it's about the underlying psychological drivers of sharing. Um, noticing that there are a couple cat videos that go popular is just like saying, well, Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, and Bill Cosby are all big names, so if I name my child Bill, I'm going to be popular, um, and my child will be really famous. That's, it's just it's confusing correlation and causation. So it's not about cats and it's not about babies. It's understanding why people talk and share. There's mm -hmm. a science to it, just like there's a science to why we make decisions uh, and you know how we make economic behaviors. Uh, and mm -hmm. so understanding what drives us to talk and share, the underlying motivators that cause us to pass things on that we're conscious of or, or non-conscious of can help us increase our batting average. I, I totally agree that there's no formula to get a billion views, uh, but there is a formula to increase the number of people that will talk about and share your content. And as for reasons of why we share, Ojuyu on Twitter says, high emotion videos give us the opportunity to enjoy things that we're not creative enough to do on our own. Of course, that's arguable. But Alex, is that part of the reason it's about emotion, that we share feelings, not necessarily facts? And also, is there a fear of missing out if you don't share it? Hmm. Well, I, I think some people do share facts. That's what I spend most right. of my day trying to do. And I think actually <laughs> Al Jazeera does right. too. Yes, um, thank you. The, uh, but people do... Um, 
react differently to them uh, and, and in terms of how things are presented. That's why storytelling matters, right? And data by itself may be somewhat inert, but if you actually explain what's going on and what's behind it, make it relevant to people, that changes it. Um, I think there's something important, though, uh, in terms of talking about the science of this. People often share things because they want it to say something about themselves. Right, so uh, it, it's almost like you think about p p putting bumper stickers up. Well, now the kind of the videos you put mm -hmm. up on your profile have very much the same effect, mm -hmm. um, and often um, those kinds of effects have network uh, effects, right? Uh, that they spread between people, and what you talk about um, can influence others, not just in terms of their physical health or their mental health, but in terms of the kinds of things they aspire to do or are interested in. Uh, raising attention about something is actually, I think, um, a, an ethical thing now. Uh, Ethan Zuckerman, who writes very thoughtfully about this uh, over at the MIT Center for Civic Media, has written some wonderful posts about that and actually broken down uh, into interesting units I think about things as micro-Kardashians. You know, what, what does it take um, to get someone's attention to put in uh, something meaningful versus something that's less so? And for uh, a lot of sites, I think they're going to actually, and when I say sites, I mean news sites, they're going to uh, consider this balance. Um, how do we tap into the popular zeitgeist to bring people here and then lead them into the other more serious stories that might not get as much um, emotional attention because they have to lead people into them, but deserve to be heard. Right. Uh, John, I want to give you the last word. Where is all this going? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think we're going to continue talking uh, and sharing things. I think what's surprising, though, is, is how much talking and sharing we actually do offline. Yeah. So there's been a lot of focus in, in this conversation on online sharing. Sharing online actually makes up only about 7% of all the word of mouth that happens. A huge percentage of what we talk about and share is actually offline, face-to-face -face communication. And so while the web and, and mobile and all these technologies have made it easier to talk and share with a larger number of people that live further away from you, I think we need to remember that most of the talking and sharing we do is with the people right around us, our, our friends, neighbors, and, and colleagues at work. And that's probably comforting to a whole lot of people. Yeah. Our thanks to all of our guests, Alex Howard, Jonah Berger, and everyone in our Google Plus Hangout. Now, on tomorrow's program, maybe one person can't change the world, but they can certainly change a country. Some of the most powerful women on the planet are not famous, you don't know their names, but they're changing minds and laws and empowering people, especially women, to take a chance, follow their passion, and do something good for the world. You're going to meet them and no doubt be inspired on the next AJ Stream. Until then, we'll see you online.